Mark Hutton, and welcome to today's show. This show is about autism spectrum disorders, and we take questions uh, from everybody. If you're the parent of a child on the spectrum, um, if you are an individual with Asperger's or high-functioning autism, if you're a teacher, if you're a sibling, if you're a therapist, we'll take questions via email, and my email is mbhutton at gmail.com. Again, that is mbhutton at gmail.com. So if you're sitting at your computer and you have some questions, feel free to fire those off right now. Anything to do with autism spectrum disorders, then it's fair game. Okay, while we're waiting for some emails to come in, I want to update you on some upcoming conferences. These are the winter conferences. For those of you that would like to attend, and this is about autism and Asperger's syndrome, in Salt Lake City, Utah, on November 30th, you have Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Jed Baker coming to town. Again, this is the Autism and Asperger's Syndrome Conference, Salt Lake City, Utah, November 30th. Dr. Temple Grandin, and Dr. Jed Baker. If you want to know how to sign up for that, go to myaspergerschild.com, myaspergerschild.com. And over on the left column, way down at the bottom, you'll see a little link down there, and you can sign up for this. Also in Galveston, Texas, on December 7th, you have, again, Dr. Temple Grandin and Stephen Shore coming to town. And then in Fort Collins, Colorado, on December 14th, Again, you have Dr. Temple Grandin. She is on the run, that lady, I'll tell you what. And also Dr. Lucy Jane Miller. Okay, that's Fort Collins, Colorado on December December 14th, yes. So be sure to write those dates down. The, these are great conferences to attend. And again, if you want to know how to sign up for that, go to myaspergerschild.com. Go over to the left column down at the bottom, and you can sign up down there. Now, please don't underestimate the value of these conferences. Now, I know they may not be in your area yet, but if they are, you just need to stop what you're doing and sign up for these. Listen to what some people have had to say about this. Here is a teacher in Denver, Colorado, who attended one of these conferences, and she says, Excellent speakers. Handouts were very helpful, and my staff back at school will benefit from reading. And uh, we have another one here from a school psychologist in Chicago, Illinois. And this individual says, best conference on autism that I've ever attended. Can't wait to employ these ideas with my clients. And we have another one here. This is a speech therapist from Fort Worth, Texas. This individual says, this conference was just another example of your commitment to excellence. Keep up the good work. And we also have a parent from Orlando, Florida, and she said, learned more about my son in two days than in the past two years. Please continue doing these. So if you haven't attended one of these conferences, then by all means, take the time to, to go. You'll be so glad that you did. It'll, it'll be a life changer. It'll be a game changer for you. Okay, we're going to take a very brief break, and then we're going to come back and start taking your emails and answering your questions. This is Mark Hutton. We'll be right back. And hey, we got Thanksgiving coming up here. Before we start taking emails, I want to give you parents some tips. Because as you probably have found out by now, some Asperger's children don't do real well when there's 15 family members over at your house that they haven't seen for a whole year. And um, a bunch of noise and activity and new smells and conversation, it's, it's overwhelming to the children. So let's look at a few little quick tips here to help you survive Thanksgiving. So parents, one of the things that you can do in order to have a relatively meltdown free Thanksgiving is to reduce the time talking about Thanksgiving before it gets here. If you have a child with Asperger's or high-functioning autism, he can't easily control his emotions. So to talk a lot about this occasion, you know, who's coming over, what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be cooking and eating and all of that could very possibly lead to some stress and anxiety. And you'll also want to enlist the help of others in your home and keeping the conversations about Thanksgiving to a minimum, especially when your Asperger's child is within earshot. Also, keep in mind that your child usually does not like changes in the home. So 
I would keep physical changes to your home to the minimum. I'm not saying don't do any decorations. You know, you may want to hang a plastic turkey on the refrigerator or whatever. That's fine. But you want to keep your changes to the home as far as decorations and all of that to a minimum because that will also contribute to the angst of your Asperger's child. Another thing that's helpful for parents to do prior to Thanksgiving or any other holiday is to explain to your child that he'll need to be given permission to leave the table. And you want to rehearse this together with some simple role play. And this is very important because it gives your child an exit strategy and also allows him to get through dinner without going into meltdown. So if you see that he's becoming upset during Thanksgiving dinner, you can activate this exit cue or this signal so that he can get out before the situation deteriorates. I also think it's terribly important to have a pre-designated room where your child can go to when he needs to calm down in the case that he's approaching a meltdown or if he's just overstimulated. So if, if it's at your home, you pick a room where he can go where it's relatively removed from the rest of the population. If you're going to another family member's home, work it out ahead of time, a room that's away from the noise, someplace where your child can go and just be quiet and relax and kind of get away from everybody for a while and then uh, he has permission to stay in there as long as he needs to and he can come out when he wants. I'm also a big proponent for allowing your child to bring one of his little uh, digital gadgets with him. This is soothing to him and uh, I know that he may go off over there in the corner by himself and entertain himself the whole time and not be very sociable. Um, if your goal is to, well, I want to take my son over here and I want him to relate to people and talk to people and say hello and be involved, well, I think that's an unrealistic goal. Um, let him take his little iPad or iPod or whatever, and he may be preoccupied with that. That is infinitely better than trying to force him to be sociable and then uh, having a huge meltdown, which could conceivably ruin the whole dinner time. Now, I know if you're going to go to another family member's home, you don't have a whole lot of control about how they're going to run the show over there. But if you're going to have Thanksgiving in your home, I would strongly recommend that you do your child a big favor by keeping visitors to a minimum and also keeping the duration of the visit to a minimum. Now, I know that that's unreasonable for some families. I totally understand that. But it may be well worth the effort in the long run. So let's say you have a big family. Instead of having 20 family members over all day long, what you could do is work it out amongst the family members so that approximately half of them are coming on Thanksgiving Day. And then approximately the other half is coming the following day or the following weekend. And they're also going to keep their visits to two or three hours, we'll say. So I know that this sounds like a drastic measure here, you know, to uh, have two Thanksgivings instead of one and to basically tell your family members that they are only allowed to be there for two or three hours. Now, some of you are not going to be willing to do that. I totally understand. But some of you will find that if you limit the population and the duration of the visit, then you have saved yourself a meltdown. And the last little tip that I want to leave you with is consider creating a social story around Thanksgiving. If you're not sure what a social story is or how to create one, go to our sister site, which is AspergerSocialStories.com. That's AspergerSocialStories.com. And there's a lot of information there about how to create one. There's multiple ways to do it. So I won't go into that now. But you're going to create a social story, and you're going to rehearse that or read that to your child or let him read it every day for maybe three or four days prior to Thanksgiving. And the story will consist of things uh, like, you know, who's going to be attending, what we'll be doing, how we're supposed to talk to one another and behave and how we can take timeouts and all of that. So uh, go to AspergerSocialStories.com, figure out how to create a good social story and work one around Thanksgiving and then go over the, that with your child every day for about three or four days prior to Thanksgiving. If you want more tips about how to survive the holidays, go to MyAspergersChild.com and there's a little search bar up there and you can type a keyword in there and that'll pull up an article and it should help you. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and look at your emails and start answering some questions. We'll be right back. Welcome 
welcome back. And we got an email here from Robert from Minnesota. He says, I'm a 38-year-old male with Asperger's syndrome, have been married to my neurotypical wife for 10 years. The last three years, she has been fairly unhappy and is complaining about the relationship and has even mentioned the possibility of divorce. She claims that I'm preoccupied with other things, mainly my work. Do you have any tips or any magic bullets that can help me save my marriage? Okay, well, first of all, thanks, Robert, for that question. There's not a whole lot of men that would be even willing to ask for help. So first of all, uh, congratulations for reaching out. The next thing I want to say has to do with some changes that you're going to need to make. One of the first things you need to begin to do is think in terms of relationships first, my passion second. Relationships first, my passion second. Your relationships would be Obviously, relationship with your wife, with your children, with your close family members and close friends. Your passion would be your employment, if that's where your passion is, or a particular hobby. Now, what I mean by this, this whole business of relationship first, is if the first thing that you do in the morning is get up and go make a cup of coffee, now the first thing you're going to do is you're going to kiss your wife on the cheek and tell her good morning. If the first thing that you do at lunchtime is take off down to Subway and get a Subway sandwich, now the first thing you're going to do at lunchtime is you're going to call your wife in the event that she can take a phone call and check in with her to see how her day's going. If the first thing that you do when you get home is say hi to your wife as you pass her in the hallway on the way to check your emails, or the first thing you do when you get home is to read the newspaper, now the first thing you're going to do when you get home is give your wife a hug and ask her how her day went. If the first thing that you do on Saturday morning is get up and go out into the garage and tinker with your grandfather clock collection, now the first thing you're going to do on Saturday morning is take your wife to breakfast. You get the point here, right? Some of you are saying, I can't do that. No, you can do that. It's not a question whether you can or can't. It's a question of whether you will or won't. How hard are you willing to work on this relationship? If you're serious about this, you will put relationships first and your passion second. Now, I'm not saying do away with your passion, and I'm not suggesting that now you want your passion to be your wife. Let's be realistic. If your passion is, for example, reading and you really enjoy staying up on politics or you have a strong interest in the stock market, I'm not going to be able to stand up here and convince you to be less passionate about that. So I'm not talking about switching passions. I'm talking about first things first. I'm talking about what you spend the most time with and what you spend time doing first. Now, a lot of men will tell me, they'll say, you know, well, my wife is the most important thing to me. Oh, really? Well, if I were to follow you around all day with a video camera and video you doing your daily tasks, what would I see? Would I see you spending most of the day with your wife? Or would I see you spending most of your time in a solitary activity and your wife is nowhere to be found? You're either at work or on the computer or you're reading or you're engaged in a favorite hobby or whatever. So the true asset test regarding what is most important to you is what you spend the most time doing. If you're not willing to put relationships first and your passion Second, then you're not serious about mending this relationship and your wife is eventually going to pick up on that and she probably will leave you. And are you in a position to start over again? Do you really want to start dating all over again? Do you really want to get married again? Chances are that if you get divorced, statistically speaking, you will live alone the rest of your life. Are you really willing to gamble like this? Your relationship with your wife should be a major priority. And how you do that is relationship first. Have a conversation. Give a hug, a kiss on a cheek, a pat on the back, a question about how her day was going. Little simple things that are really not that time consuming. You do that first, then you move on to your activity. Are you going to spend more time with your activity than with your wife? Probably. It's unrealistic to assume that you're going to quit your job and spend the entire day with your wife. I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm saying you take care of relationships first. It doesn't take that much time or energy to do that. Then you move on to your activity. Now, even though your wife might, may be sitting there thinking, yeah, he needs to start doing this and he should have been doing it all along, I understand perfectly that this is difficult for some Asperger's men to do. I'm totally on the same page with you with that. But here's how I can make it easier for you. You tend to be task-oriented right? More than relationship oriented. So all you do, and this is kind of a head game that you play on yourself, is you turn this into another task. Now your relationships are a primary task. Put it on your to-do list if you need to. This sounds ridiculous to your neurotypical wife, but your to-do list is in the relationship category can look like this. Kiss wife in the morning. 
Call wife at lunch. Give wife a hug and ask about day after work. Take wife to breakfast Saturday morning. If you need to write it out like that, along with all your other tasks, hey, more power to you. Robert, I thank you for that question, and good luck in the relationship. I hope that you can win her back. Feel free to send me an email. Let me know how it's going, okay? Okay, we've got another question here from Mrs. Holtz from Florida. She says, I have a 26-year-old son, high-functioning. He was in college for a semester, had a part-time job in addition to going to school full-time, has recently returned home, and is doing very little other than watching TV and playing video games. He seems terribly unmotivated to find employment or continue his education. If I could have one tip to get him motivated to move out and get busy with life, what would it be? Well, if I could only give you one tip, it would be this. Make it more uncomfortable to depend on you than to launch into adulthood. Now, a huge part of making your adult Asperger's child uncomfortable is to stop paying for all the extras. In other words, things that he views as necessities, but they really aren't. Now, even in today's world, your son or daughter can live without cell phones, can live without internet connection, can live without haircuts, video games, and any other leisure activity you can name. Now, this is hard for some parents to hear because some parents have been so giving and enabling and overprotective for so long that to cut their child off like this just cuts against the grain of their parenting style. Now, I know this is difficult for some of you to hear, but you know what? Your adult child can, for example, eat cheap. He can have macaroni and cheese. He can have Raymond noodles. I know that's not as good as mom's good old-fashioned roast beef, potatoes, and carrots and biscuits, but he can eat cheap. He can take the bus if he can't afford a car or insurance. If he doesn't have money for cigarettes and alcohol, he can do without them. If he doesn't have money for clothes, he can go to the Salvation Army or the Goodwill. Now, I know this sounds like terribly tough love, but you know what? A lot of us, when we were younger and struggling to make it on our own, we had to live like this. It's no different with your child. A few months of eating food out of a box and not having any money for cigarettes and not having an internet connection or a cell phone, your son just might decide to go get a job. So make it uncomfortable for your child to continue to live at home. So there's your one tip, Mrs. Holtz. I hope it was helpful, and I know it was a doozy, but uh, let's see just how much tough love you can muster up. You would be surprised how many parents will not do this. Uh, they feel guilty about doing it. They feel like they're hurting their child. And you would be shocked at how many cases that I deal with where the adult child with Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism is actually not only mooching off of mom and dad, but the, the, this adult child is also being verbally and in some cases physically aggressive to the parents. So you do not need to feel guilty about employing some tough love here. Let go of false guilt. False guilt is the feeling that you have when you're trying to set some boundaries, set some limits, and teach your child how to function in the real world. But in the back of your mind, you're worried that you're hurting your child, that you're making a bad problem worse, that you're a bad parent, that you should do better, that you should be ashamed for setting these types of boundaries. All of that is false guilt that will keep you stuck right where you're at. In some situations, adult children with Asperger's and high-functioning autism have literally worn out their welcome by taking and taking and taking from the parent without giving anything back in return. So you don't have to feel guilty about moving your child into independence so that you can have your own life back. You have the right to enjoy peaceful evenings in your own home. You have the right to have the environment you want in your house. You have the right to spend your money on things for yourself. That's not being selfish. That's not being uncaring or insensitive. That's the way it's supposed to be. You've raised your son or daughter. He or she is an adult now. So let go of false guilt. Short 30 second break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. 
Jack, before we go on to the next question, I have another point that I want to make with respect to uh, parents who are in Miss Holt's situation. In other words, you have a perfectly capable yet very unmotivated adult child with Asperger's still living at home. Now, we certainly want parents to be advocates for their child with Asperger's or high-functioning autism. We as therapists, we preach that, we teach that. We want you to go to school and lobby for your child. We want you to participate in the IEP process and, and be the best advocate that you can. We want you to teach your child how to be his own self-advocate and all that. But too many of us as parents, out of the notion that our Asperger's child is not quite capable, we have gone way past advocacy to enabling and overprotection. Many parents of adult Asperger's children have moved from caring for their child to caretaking. And many of these parents are held hostage by their own emotions of anger, frustration, disappointment, guilt, fear, etc. And they frequently wonder what will happen if they do throw their adult child out of the nest without a net. So, it's good that you advocate for your child, but it's also good to make the distinction between advocacy and over-nurturing. Now, we as parents sometimes become overprotective and over-nurturing out of a loving, caring heart. Our intentions are of the best. Maybe we feel like our child is vulnerable, naive, or otherwise incapable of doing certain things. And so we want to protect him, of course. But the unfortunate side effect of overprotectiveness is the child feels a false sense of security and confidence. It's a lot like a child who has weak muscles due to the fact that the parent always does the lifting for him. Then one day the parent noticing that the child has weak muscles, suggests to the child that he go to the gym and work out and start developing some muscles. But the child sees no need to do this since he has the parent to do the lifting for him. The same is true with dealing with life's challenges. As long as your Asperger's son has you to deal with life for him, there's no need for him to develop any emotional muscles or social skills. So I use this analogy to say this. Your first course of action is to begin the process of backing out of the equation. In other words, stop assisting so much because your over-assistance is literally stunting your child's emotional growth. Now, we're not saying don't assist at all. You are going to have to help out here. But I'm simply saying instead of doing things for your child, start doing things with your child with the goal of eventually getting to the point where you'd back totally out of the situation and let him take control entirely. Okay, let's move on to our next email. Now, we have one from Rose. She lives in Arizona. She states, my husband has Asperger's syndrome, and we've been married for over 15 years. He has trouble understanding my emotions. Whenever I tell him how I feel about a particular thing, he seems indifferent, and all I get is a blank expression. And she wants to know, is this typical of Asperger's, or is this just a personality trait of his? Well, without talking to your husband face-to-face, -face, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're dealing with an Asperger's trait there rather than the fact that he's just selfish and doesn't care about how you feel. I would find that hard to believe. Um, if you've been married to him for 15 years, you must have been doing a lot of things right. Now, keep in mind that your husband has, if he has Asperger's syndrome, he has this thing called mind blindness. And a lot of people have difficulty understanding, you know, what is that? Well, um, let's imagine a movie scene, okay, that begins with the, with the following scenario. Uh, a woman enters a bedroom, and she walks around in it. She opens a few drawers. She looks behind some dressers. She looks underneath the bed, uh, and then she leaves. Okay, that's the scene. Now, most people couldn't witness that scene without thinking about, you know, why this woman was in the bedroom looking around for stuff. Maybe she was looking for something she thought was in the bedroom. Maybe she heard something in there and wanted to find out what made the noise. Uh, multiple thoughts might go through your head. Now, all of these explanations are based on our inferences about the woman's mental state. Okay. What we're attempting to do, in essence, is to read her mind. And most of us neurotypicals in, engage in such mind reading all day long, every day. 
In other words, we try to figure out what other people's motives are. What did they mean by this particular statement and so on? And without this ability, we would be mind blind. We'd be unaware of other people's mental existence, of the existence of thoughts, emotions, intentions, and so on. We would be unable to make sense of the actions of others. And unfortunately, that's the dilemma that your husband is in. He has difficulty making sense of others, including their emotions. So your husband may have trouble understanding the emotions of other people in general, yours and co-workers and so on. And also, it's very possible that the subtle messages that are sent to him from other people by way of facial expression, eye contact, body language, and so on, he probably misses these little things. He doesn't pick up on these subtle cues, and so he may come off as being egotistical, selfish, or uncaring. And I think that these are rather unfair labels because he is neurologically unable to understand other people's emotional states due to this mind blindness stuff. He might even be kind of upset and remorseful when people tell him, you know, that what he said or what he did was hurtful or inappropriate. So in answer to your question, yes, uh, difficulty understanding other people's emotions is definitely an Asperger's trait. And what you could do to help him with that would be to, one of the things you can do is to stop talking in terms of feelings. Um, It would be like if he didn't speak French, but you do. And so you have an important message for him and you tell him this message in French. He doesn't get it. So... You stop speaking French and you start speaking English. And the same thing is true with these with feelings. Since he's not an individual who can tune in to exactly how you're feeling, and since he has the empathy level of someone with Asperger's syndrome, you want to stop talking feelings and start talking facts. And I know that's probably not your style. But in, in the future, instead of saying, well, I feel this way about that, you may just want to cut to the chase and tell him what you need him to do differently. Hope that makes sense. Thanks for that question, Rose. We're going to take another quick short break and we'll be right back. tell you that if you sent in an email and I didn't answer your question through the course of this show, just know that I will get to it. So if you have a question, feel free to send it in. And even though I may not respond to it verbally on the show here, I will get around to responding to it. My email is mbhutton at gmail.com. I also want to point out a few resources for you. If you go to myaspergerschild.com in the upper left, you'll see a place where you can sign up for my free weekly newsletter. This newsletter goes out twice a week, and it's specifically designed for parents of Asperger's children. And we're going to look at parenting skills, parenting strategies specific to that child. I should also mention our support group. If you are a parent of a child with Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism and you want to rub shoulders with other parents that are in the same boat as you, then feel free to go to Parenting Asperger's Children Support Group. Just do a Google search for Parenting Asperger's Children Support Group. We have about 7,500 members over there. And one of the most therapeutic things you can do as a parent, especially if you have a newly diagnosed son or daughter, is to pick the brains of other parents that are further down the road than you. Because they're going to have some answers and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. When you get the advice from another parent who has been there and done that, it will save you a bunch of headaches, I'm sure. I also want to mention that if you're thinking about homeschooling your child and you're not sure exactly how to go about that or what resources are available, feel free to send me an email and I'll send you a link to that information. Also, if you're going to have to have an individualized education program or an IEP done for your child and you're not sure about that process or what should be in the IEP, again, feel free to email me and I'll send you a link to that information. Well, we are out of time for today and I want to leave you with one last thing. If you go to myaspergerschild.com, you're going to see an article this week entitled How to Have a Meltdown-Free Thanksgiving. So if you're a little apprehensive about how Thanksgiving is going to go and you need some tips, go to myaspergerschild.com. And on that note, I hope everybody does have a great Thanksgiving and we'll probably be doing this show again the first week of December. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.